This week on Cracked Signs, just because something is popular doesn't mean it's well understood. Case in point, DNA. Hey, this is Jonathan Jerry, and you're watching Cracked Signs, the show from the McGill Office for Science and Society that separates sense from nonsense on the scientific stage. DNA has become an important part of our discourse. DNA can be used to exonerate, to alter crops, to potentially cure diseases, and to show white supremacists that they really did come from Africa after all. It is undeniable that there is an appetite for DNA and the power that it evokes. Last year, Ancestry DNA sold roughly 1.5 million of their straight-to-consumer DNA kits, and that's just over the American Thanksgiving weekend. That led Wired reporter Megan Molteni to write, that's like 2,000 gallons of saliva, enough to fill a modest above-ground swimming pool with a genetic history of every person in the city of Philadelphia. What gets lost in the great spitting of 2017 is that interest does not necessarily equate knowledge. There are many myths about DNA, and for good reasons. Unless you're extracting it, DNA is not something that you see. And it's not intuitive how it all works, how a long string of so-called letters ends up coding for an entire organism. There's something mystical about the molecule of life, and that's where our intuition can lead us astray. So I want to knock down some of these myths tonight, and I want to make sure I reach a lot of people and change a lot of minds. So I've decided to combine the popular BuzzFeed listicle format with the award-winning movie Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri to create Cracked Science's own Top 5 Billboards Outside Coding, Missouri. If that doesn't generate views, I don't know what will. Billboard number five, Almost all food has DNA. There's this idea that genetically engineered food, commonly known as GMOs, has DNA, but that non-engineered food doesn't. And that's just wildly wrong. Carrots contain DNA. Apples contain DNA. Brisket, milk, wheat flour, they all have DNA. Most of what we eat and drink contains DNA because it's made up of cells, which contain the molecule of life. There are exceptions, sugar, salt, water, alcohol, highly refined substances which are extracted from foodstuff generally don't contain DNA. But most of what we eat, whether it's genetically engineered or not, contains DNA. And that's always been the case. Billboard number four, there's no such thing as a fish gene. When researchers were experimenting with a tomato that would be more tolerant to frost, they added an antifreeze gene that came from the winter flounder. And so the tomato was nicknamed the fish tomato. And it's easy to imagine that the genes inside of a fish have some sort of fish odor, or that all of these genes are specific to the fish and have no business being inside a tomato. But if we take two seconds to remember Biology 101, we know that, for example, humans and chimps share up to 98.8% of their genes, depending on how you count. While we may want our genes to contain some mystical essence of humanity, that's just not what they do. Genes are discrete stretches of DNA that code for a protein, and proteins play a number of roles in our bodies. For example, the Hox proteins made by the fruit fly will help guide its development to make sure its mandibles, antennae, thorax, and abdomen all grow in the right order. But because Hox genes are conserved across so many species, you can remove one of them in fruit flies and replace it with a chicken Hox gene, and the fly develops just fine. Surprisingly enough, the outcome of this real-world experiment had nothing in common with the little-known David Cronenberg sequel, The Fly 3, Chicken Little's Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. There's no such thing as a fly gene, a tomato gene, or a human gene. Just like you could use a yellow Lego to make Bowser, you can use that same yellow Lego to make Pikachu. Billboard number three, you don't have the gene for Huntington's disease. It's a mutation. On so many TV shows, I hear characters sighing with relief as they learn they don't have the gene for this or that disease. What this sounds like is that someone with Huntington's disease, for example, has a whole gene whose sole purpose is to give them this disease, whereas healthy individuals don't have this gene and instead have, I guess, an empty space in its place. It's sort of the gene of the gap argument, I suppose. We all have this gene. It's called the Huntington gene, and it happens to have a repeat of three letters, C-A-G, over and over again. People who have the disease 
have a longer stretch of this repeat, as if someone was copy-pasting the repeat and dozed off for a few seconds while hitting Control v A gene's purpose is not to cause disease. The gene codes for a protein that has a specific job to do inside your body. For instance, the gene associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy codes for a protein that normally connects a muscle fiber to its surroundings. When it's mutated, the protein can't do its job, and that's what causes the disease. Billboard number two, it's often more complicated than just one gene equals one disease. I have given very simple examples so far with Huntington's disease and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where a single gene is mutated and that leads to a disease. And when genetics was just getting started, this was the thinking that each disease has a single gene behind it. We now know that, as with Taylor Swift's Facebook relationship status, it's a lot more complicated than that. Really common diseases, like asthma, tend to be caused by mutations in more than one gene. Then there's cancer. While there are single mutations that predispose you to developing certain forms of cancer, we know that cancer is an accumulation of many mutations in many different genes, and some of these mutations are known as driver mutations. They are needed to occur to drive the cancer forward. On average, breast cancer needs four of these mutations, whereas colon cancer needs 11. But even with simple traits like hair and eye color, we are far from the one gene, one trait rule. These are the known genes involved in creating the particular shade of hair color you have. Some physical traits and diseases are caused by variations in one gene, but for many, it's the shared responsibility of a whole bunch of them. And finally, billboard number one, spending $250 on a DNA kit to find out if you have a unibrow is totally worth it. No, sorry, that's not it. That's, that's not it. Billboard number one, astronaut Scott Kelly's genes were not altered after spending a year in space. Despite what you may have read online, it wasn't that Scott Kelly's genes were mutated by his space travel, but rather that their expression was different. And when I tell you what this means, you'll realize that it's nowhere near as spectacular as some media outlets made it out to be. You see, genes make proteins, but genes aren't always making proteins. It's like a bread maker making bread. They make baguettes and ciabattas during the day, but they sleep at night. Before a big holiday, they may get an increase in customers and they have to work longer and make more bread. It's the same situation with a gene. How much protein it makes depends on a number of factors, and that's known as the regulation of gene expression. The levels of your hormones can affect gene expression. The drugs you're taking can do the same. The amount of oxygen you're getting, the viruses you catch, whether or not you smoke, all of these things can affect, well, how much bread your bread maker makes. Gene expression can be influenced by a number of factors, so it's no surprise that spending a year in space in a microgravity environment with disrupted sleep patterns and a diet that does not exactly scream Michelin stars had a significant impact on Kelly's gene expression. So, to recap, most of what you eat has DNA. Genetic engineering did not violate the essence of your tomato. Nobody has the gene for a particular disease. Genetics is often complicated, and going to space will not turn you into a lizard creature unrecognizable by your twin. And as a final bit of DNA debunking, when scientists take a gene from one species to put it into another, it looks nothing like this deleted scene from David Cronenberg's The Fly, in which Jeff Goldblum tries to fuse a cat to a baboon. My recommendation this week is for a book I haven't yet read, but if it has anywhere near the richness and delectability of the author's first tome, it's worth a read. I'm talking, of course, of Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee's The Gene, An Intimate History. Mukherjee's freshman effort, The Emperor of All Maladies, was a fascinating and exhaustive history of how we came to know what we know about cancer. 
In The Gene, the Pulitzer Prize winning author turns to genetics. From Darwin to the double helix, from the influence of genes on IQ to the post-genome era, this book has it all. I can't wait to dig into this 500-page mammoth that was on the Washington Post's 10 best books of 2016 list. If you want a deep dive on genetics, this is it. This video series is one small part of what our office does, so go to mcgill.ca slash OSS to see what else we do to help separate sense from nonsense, and do subscribe to our newsletter. You can follow me on Twitter at Cracked Science, and join us next time for science that may or may not be all it's cracked up to be.